I'm here today to talk about two of life's great pleasures that, when combined, are often considered taboo. And they are eating and sex. <laughs> But believe it or not, it's becoming one of the hottest new trends in the United States and certain parts of Europe. And today, you will all have the opportunity, with the help of Chef Allian, <laughs> to experience eating in sex. <laughs> Not only is it a hot new trend, but it's also a way for you to actively join in a food revolution towards a more sustainable food supply. So by now, all of us, if you, unless you've been dead asleep for the past decade or so, you know that human species on a trajectory that's pretty scary. For example, if you look at a world map of water scarcity, all the red countries currently are overusing their water supplies. Essentially, using more water than they have available to them. Yeah, the Netherlands is not on this map. However, this is just a snapshot of one natural resource, and it's a snapshot of today. So, when you add on a growing global population, and then you add in a changing climate, it's pretty evident to see that, at the very least, we're going to see massive human migration patterns away from these stressed areas, and. It, For the history of humanity, that comes with disease, famine, wars, and massive die-offs, and potentially at a larger scale than our planet has even seen. And the only thing that will change the, director, the trajectory that we're on towards this more sustainable path is the individual actions that we take in our daily lives. It's not enough just to know about the problem and know what the solution is. And it reminds me of an example from back home in the United States. The statistic being 97% of science, scientists agree that humans are influencing the growing warming trend. And about half of our population, a little over half of our population, is scientifically literate enough to understand that. However, only 10% of our country's population rides the bus, rides a bike, or walks. Work. So there's a dramatic difference between our knowledge base and our actions. And, and I know that that statistic is much higher here in the Netherlands. <laughs> However, before you go start patting yourself on the back too quickly, even more so than your transportation decision, a greater impact is what you decide to eat. For example, 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock alone. That's more than the entire transportation sector. And 90% of our global water use goes to agriculture. So the future survival of our species depends on our appetites. And if we can incorporate more efficient forms of food, it will prove that our diets will dictate our destinies. And yes, some of those more efficient foods crawl on six legs. In 2012, the United Nations issued a report that said insects could be one of the key factors in feeding the growing global populations. And they explained that because of three reasons. They're more efficient, they increase the diversity of our food supply, and they're more adaptable to a changing climate. So let's look at that a little closer. So as far as efficiency, if you take 10 pounds of feed and you give that to a cow, that cow will grow one pound. If you take that same 10 pounds of feed and you give it to crickets, They'll grow six pounds, so dramatically more efficient in turning plant matter into an edible protein. And I'm from specifically the western part of the United States, and around the world, including where I live, we have rivers running completely dry. And where I'm from, over half of our water in those rivers goes to irrigating feed for cows. And it's all because individuals choose on a daily basis to put cow on their plate. But the choice is ours. So, if we look at the water savings, insects happen to be even more efficient than livestock substitutes like corn, soy, and rice. So, specifically, I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and in that area, there was a prehistoric culture. There's evidence that suggests they would go around and they would collect grasshoppers and crickets out of the Great Salt Lake, 
and then they'd dry them in the sun, and then they'd use stone matate, stone tools, to grind them up and turn it into this like, cricket flower-like thing. And then they'd mix it with a bunch of nuts, fruits, and berries. They'd create a snack that would last all winter long as their source of protein. And anthropologists have calculated the efficiency of food gathering based on the amount of calories, human calories spent, versus the amount of food calories collected. And it was one of the most efficient forms of food gathering ever experienced. So much so that several of these bands gave up hunting large game entirely. So, if it can be an efficient form of food in the past, it can be an efficient form of food in the future. And this is what the future looks like. This is a cricket farm in the United States. And this one in particular is growing crickets for human consumption. And so, as you can see, they're grown in bins. So we know they're more efficient, but this is how they're more adaptable to a changing climate. So you can grow these bins indoors in a warehouse, and you can climate control it, and you get more protein per unit area because you can raise them vertically. So they're more efficient, they're more adaptable to a changing climate, and it dramatically increases the diversity of our food supply. There's over 1,600 varieties of insects eaten around the world, and they're eaten actually in most countries around the world, just pretty much not in Europe and North America. Why not? Well, there's one reason why we don't eat them in the United States and Europe, and that one reason I can tell you, no matter what language you speak, I don't even need words to tell you the one reason why we don't eat insects here. This is why. That's the only reason. It's because some people make a funny-looking face when you talk about the idea. <laughs> and I'm, I'm actually pretty sure I saw some of those funny faces when I first introduced the concept. But in order to analyze this, we got to dive into what is this funny face. And so we decided to start a company three years ago that directly addresses this. We decided to introduce a food product that introduces insects as a healthy and sustainable protein that directly addresses the cultural perception. Because even though our vision is for a more sustainable agricultural sector, we have to tear down that cultural bias to make room for that food supply. So, in order to do that, we need to dive into this a little deeper. So where does this cultural bias come from? Well, there's a man by the name of Jeff Lockwood who has a theory that humans have this heightened sense of awareness associated with insects, because for tens of thousands of years as foragers, they were a part of our food supply. And we had to quickly identify if an insect was a healthy food that we needed to grab before it skittered away, or was it a spider or a scorpion that would harm us, and we were the ones that had to skitter away from it. And so we have this heightened awareness, yet when certain groups moved northern, to the northern latitudes, there was fewer insects in the natural environment than there are in the tropics, and insects became not a part of their food supply. So similar to this like, fight-or-flight mechanism, I like to call this the meal or squeal mechanism. But we've eliminated the whole meal aspect, and we're left with this squeal. Okay, so we know where this came from. Now what tools are we going to use to address that? Well, we decided to look at other food products that had the same cultural barrier to address. And the closest parallel that we could draw was sushi. Fifty years ago, in the United States, we made that funny-looking face at the concept of eating raw fish. And it wasn't until a man by the name of Chiro Mashida in Los Angeles created the California Roll as a gentle introduction to the concept of sushi for us. And he, one of the most intelligent things that he did was that he took the rice and he put it on the outside of the nori so that we didn't have to visually see that foreign-looking seaweed. So, okay, we're getting ideas here. We decided we had to create a California roll of insects. So what we do is, this is, these are photos from our kitchen. So these are crickets from that farm I showed you earlier. We rinse them just like you would a big bowl of shrimp, another edible arthropod. And then we take them and we dry them out. We use a stone matate to grind it down to a fine flour. Sound a little familiar, maybe? So we know that language is very intricately woven into culture in our perception of things. So we knew we had to come up with a very creative term for what we had just created. 
and we decided to call it cricket flower. <laughs> Maybe not so creative after all. And actually not very descriptive either because it's almost entirely protein. If you look at the nutritional content of it, it's about 60% protein, which is twice the protein content of beef. So we take that extremely nutritious cricket flour, we mix nuts, berries, and fruits, and then we pack it together in a stack in the form of an energy bar. And it's very visually recognizable to our culture about what is food. And so it's designed to not only be a gentle introduction, but at the same time, be a wrecking ball to that cultural bias. Well, that's all well and good. That's all theory. <laughs> so the real test is, are people going to eat this? So we took it to the streets, and we started out at our local farmer's market, and we presented it as the very first introduction of eating insects in the United States. And we were met with many funny-looking faces, absolutely. It was the first concept of it. It's, it's changed a lot in the last couple of years, and it's very rare now that when we introduce it, it's the first time people have heard about it, just like many of you probably have heard about the concept of eating insects now. However, as we got all those funny-looking faces initially, I would tell our team to physically, when you get that funny-looking face or somebody makes a snide comment, physically stand up a little bit taller. And the next person you speak to, Raise your voice just a little bit louder because we need to physically remind ourselves that we are proud to be a voice of our children and our grandchildren that deserve a sustainable form of food. And for every dozen or so of those funny looking faces that came by, we'd have somebody that came by that just really got it and they were ready to challenge their own cultural perceptions. And one of them I remember very vividly. It was elderly woman who was actually working three booths down. She was selling her organic heirloom tomatoes. And she came to our booth, and she, she just listened at first, and she just read all of our information. And by the, when people started clearing away from the booth, she actually came around to the back of it, and she gathered each of our hands together. And she looked up into her eyes, and she said, thank you for doing this. And that validation from her was enough energy to withstand you know, thousands of funny-looking faces pointed our way. Because that dirt in her fingernails and the calluses on her hands were evidence that she is very intimately aware of the fragile relationship between our earth and the food that it produces that we rely on for our survival. So, as we pass on the responsibility and the honor of our food systems from her hands into future generations, it will be one of the most important issues facing our children's civilizations. And so if you're concerned about that like I am, I have a few messages for you. So first, I beg you, I beg you to at least consider the global impacts of your daily actions especially those of when you put food on your plate. Second, I challenge you to stand up a little bit taller and to raise your voice a little bit louder when you decide to eat consciously. Because when you do, you not only create a consumer demand for a more sustainable food supply, but you also become a consumer demanding it. And third, I dare you to be a pirate of your own cultural habits and activities that don't fit with your vision of a more sustainable future and to tear them down. And tonight, I invite you to do that with the help of Chef Olyan and his dish that he's prepared to expand your minds, expand your palates, and join us in a food revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you.